All right, well, good morning, Redemption Tempe. Good morning. How many of you saw and remember Mary Poppins as a kid? Yeah. Right, show of hands, show of hands. I got there. Yes, that's right. Well, this Disney classic, this 1964 kids movie, Leonard Maltin, the renowned film critic, he called this Walt Disney's crowning achievement. It won five Academy Awards, not only for best actor, but also for best music. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, right? Just a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, right? Mary Poppins, that was, it was the goods. And it, well, I've got good news for you that Disney is re-releasing this classic. Yes, they have digitally restored the footage and I'm so excited. Like I, I, I know this is Sunday, I know this is church and we're gonna get to the word of God in a minute, but first I'm just so excited they're re-releasing this that I really want to, I gotta show you the trailer. And so let's watch this trailer for the re-release of Mary Poppins here. Now, <laughs> now wait, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Scary Mary, what have they done to our Mary Poppins? Man, my childhood magic, and they're saying, hide your children. They have turned this classic into a horror film. Now, what's interesting is they have actually, uh, all those scenes that we saw were actually in the real Mary Poppins, right? So they have spliced out real scenes, and yet they have reinserted them into a different storyline. And they have imposed upon it their own soundtrack, their own ominous, foreboding music. And in so doing, they have been able to turn this classical, this classic tale into a horror film. They have desecrated the story. And sometimes that is exactly what our culture can do with the Bible. Right? See, today we're going to be looking at a tough passage of Scripture. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 15. And so if you have your Bible and you want to open there and get ready, uh, we're going to be looking at this passage, which is about Saul's destruction of the Amalekites. And many critics have spliced out this scene, have spliced out this story, this chapter of 1 Samuel 15, and have reinserted it into a different storyline, have called this a text of terror, have imposed their own dark and ominous soundtrack of a vengeful and vindictive God. And now it's true, heads up, there's some gnarly stuff in this passage. We've got God commanding war. We've got women and infants mentioned. We've got Saul judged for what can look like showing mercy. So even if you're not a critic, if you and I, if we love Jesus and we're reading along in the Bible and we come across this passage, it can cause us to go, hey, what is going on here? You can find yourself going, man, I, I thought the Bible was all about God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love, to quote the awesome and true Jesus Storybook Bible. Okay. And yet, like turning Mary Poppins into Scary Mary, sometimes passages like these can be spliced out to turn the beauty of the biblical story into a horror film. That's what some have done. They plucked it out of context, and when we come across it, it can challenge our faith. And yet I've got good news today that this is actually a good and powerful passage. It's tough, but it's good. And so what we're going to seek to do today is to place this back within the biblical story as a whole to see how it becomes a part of God's good story for the world. So let's open up to 1 Samuel 15 and read starting in verse 1. <clears throat> and Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Tel 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. Don't be an enemy of God or your day of destruction will come. The Amalekites here, they have made themselves an enemy of God, an unrepentant opposition to God and his people, and now their day has come. God commands Saul to destroy the Amalekites, and that can sound harsh to us at first. He even mentions the women and children, and we can ask What did they do wrong? Do they really need to be destroyed? And some have suggested that these should even be listed as war crimes, historical war crimes. Five observations, however, can help us understand what's happening here. The first is the history of the Amalekites. We ask, who were the Amalekites? Earlier in the story, if we take this spliced out scene and put it back into the biblical story as a whole, we find that these were not just your friendly next door neighbors. That throughout the biblical story, the Amalekites were unrepentant enemies opposed to God and his people. So in Exodus 17, for example, the Amalekites attack Israel when they first come out of Egypt. Israel is a vulnerable and defenseless nation of homeless, wandering slaves. And God arises to defend them from the viciousness of the Amalekites. This continues in Numbers, Numbers 14, where the Amalekites attack Israel in the wilderness again. Deuteronomy 25 goes on to tell Israel, hey, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came up out of Egypt, when you were weary and worn out. They met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. The Amalekites were like muggers preying upon the vulnerable. And it doesn't stop there. As we go on throughout the book of Judges leading up towards 1 Samuel, we find the Amalekites are regularly attacking and oppressing God's people. They are like the Nazis, literally. They are consistently bent on the Jews' destruction. Actually, in World War II, it's interesting, the Jews did refer regularly to the Nazis as Amalekites. They used that name as a metaphor, saying as While they were in concentration camps, while they were being exterminated, they looked at that as like an echo of what the Amalekites had sought to do to them in their history. So in verse 2 here, God says that the reason he's dealing with the Amalekites, he says it's it's because of this history of oppression against his people. God had said, those who bless you I will bless, and those who curse you I will curse. And the Amalekites have consistently cursed God's people and his purposes. So when we take this spliced out scene and we put it back into the whole film, we see who the Amalekites are, their character development, you could say, as a people in the arc of the story, and it is not pretty. All right, but that's just the first observation. So now let's go to the second observation. Second observation here is the context, the context of a military force. We need to ask, where does this battle take place? And in verse 4, we're told that it's in the city of Amalek, uh, where the soldiers lie in wait to ambush the city. Now, in the ancient Near East, cities were different than they are today. Uh, When you and I hear the word city, we think of a civilian population center. But in the ancient Near East, these were small, fortified military outposts or garrisons. Uh, I live in the city of Tempe, and I walk outside of my front door, and I see other homes and kids playing in the front yard, and I walk down one direction, and I find like a school and a hospital, and I walk down the street the other way, and you find restaurants and businesses, because cities today are where the people live. But not so in the ancient Near East. The city, or the Hebrew word, ir, these were fortified military outposts, usually small garrisons, that guarded the roads leading up to the villages where the people lived. So the 
image that you and I, the image that we should have in mind here is that Israel is taking out the Pentagon, not New York City, right? Like God is demolishing the Great Wall of China, not demolishing Beijing, right? These were defensive military installations, not civilian population centers. When we place this spliced out scene back into the whole film, we see that in the pattern of Old Testament battles against cities, these were military skirmishes with forts and garrisons. Okay, the third observation that can help us here has to do with the nature of ancient warfare. Like, how is this battle taking place? In ancient Near East, in war, civilians kept away from the battle. They kept their distance. I think one challenge for us today is that when we think of ancient warfare, a lot of our imagination and vision has been uh, captivated or informed by like the Middle Ages, or maybe even Lord of the Rings, right? Like with like the castle and the sense of like, hey, when battle's coming, all the civilians run inside the castle, put up the drawbridge, hold things up, and you look for protection and defense inside of the castle or the city. But not so in the ancient Near East. Scholars observe how civilians were, A, generally not in the cities. They were usually, these cities were usually just populated by soldiers and government officials in these military forts. And B, even if civilians were there, once the battle started, they'd run. As John Golden Gay, a respected Old Testament scholar, observes on ancient warfare, he says, when a city is in danger of falling, people do not simply wait there to be killed, they get out. Only people who do not get out, such as the city's defenders, get killed. This means women, infants, and other civilians uh, were most likely not in the garrison, and even if they were, they would flee. Hebrew scholars note the phrase here, men, women, children, infants, and all the animals in verse 3, this is stock Hebrew language for all. It does not necessarily mean that women and infants were in there, that were, were present. Indeed, ancient audiences would have assumed that they were not present. What the text is saying is destroy the military outpost and all, everything, anyone, any, everyone, anyone inside is either removed or destroyed. God wants to remove this enemy outpost from his kingdom. In ancient audiences would have heard this as a military skirmish to remove a defensive military installation. All right, fourth observation is this, that Israel is using what I like to call ancient trash talk, right? Ancient trash talk, meaning in the Bible and the ancient world as a whole, they like to use dramatic language to talk about war, language that at first it can sound almost like genocidal to our modern ears. So you can read dozens of accounts from the ancient Near East, nations surrounding Israel, and I've done this. You can go find these and read these accounts. They're fascinating. But you read these accounts, for example, and what the surrounding nations will say all the time, they'll say things like, we annihilated them. We wipe them off the face of the planet. They will never be around again. The only thing is, you come back a year later in their history books, and the same people who were supposedly wiped out are back again, strong as ever, beating them and causing just as more damage, right? And so uh, this was recognized to be hyperbolic language that was a regular way of narrating like war histories at all. <clears throat> now, I think you can think of this as something like trash talk in a locker room, right? In a basketball game, for example, where let's say after the basketball game, you go back in the locker room and you hear the players talking. And they're like, Dude, we wiped the floor with them. They could not get a thing past us. They had nothing on us. We just destroyed them. And if you took them literalistically, you would think the score was 120 to zero, right? And then you go outside the locker room and you look up at the scoreboard and you see, okay, it was 120 to 105. Like it was a decisive victory just not as extreme as the rhetoric alone would lead you to believe. And you wouldn't say like, why are you basketball players got to be lying in the locker room, right? You wouldn't accuse them of lying. You would just recognize, hey, that's an understood way of speaking. One of the first things we have to do with what we call hermeneutics, like study of scripture, going what's going on in this passage is trying to understand what did this mean in its original context and what kind of genre or literature is this? And this genre of ancient war narrative like to use rhetoric like this. Now, even if we did not have this historical kind of uh, information from the surrounding nations, the Bible makes clear that it's using this in other places. So um, it's not just the ancient nations that spoke this way. The Bible does too. So in Joshua 9 to 12, for example, uh, this passage where Joshua essentially says, man, we 
He says, we utterly destroyed them. We did not leave any, leave alive anything that breathes. We showed no mercy. And he goes on to say, basically, we took out all the kings of Canaan, all the armies of Canaan. We took all of the land of Canaan. Now, the only problem is that we are in Joshua 12. He's saying, donezo, everything's ours. Like, it's all the, only we're in Joshua 12. All you got to do is keep reading Joshua 13, 14, 15, all the way through the book of Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, even beyond where we are today. And you can see... You can go many generations in books of the Bible later and find out that these enemies that Joshua supposedly wiped out are still around, strong as ever, causing all sorts of trouble. This is what leads Christopher J. H. Wright, one of the top evangelical Old Testament scholars in the world, to say this. He says, we must also recognize that the language of warfare back then, it had a conventional rhetoric that liked to make absolute and universal claims about total victory and completely wiping out the enemy. Such rhetoric often exceeded reality on the ground. This is not to accuse the biblical writers of falsehood, but to recognize the literary conventions of writing about warfare. When he says this is not to accuse the biblical writers of falsehood, he's saying that would be like going to the basketball players after the game and being like, why are you guys lying about the game? They're not lying. They're using an understood, established way of speaking in this genre of literature. <clears throat> okay, so those are four observations. Here is the fifth one. It's related is that the Amalekites are still around after. Right? All we got to do is keep reading the story and go, what do we see after the story? Again, we take the spliced out scene, we put it into the film, we go, oh, the Amalekites, supposedly wiped out, quote unquote, here, are still around and causing havoc afterwards. So uh, we know a more complicated picture is happening because we just go a little further, even in First and Second Samuel here. And later in First Samuel, for example, the Amalekites are attacking King David They're raping and pillaging, stealing Israel's wives, and plundering their land. Later in the book of Esther, it's Haman, an Amalekite, who leads the way in trying to wipe out Israel off the face of the planet. All right, so if you're interested in diving more into this, as John and Warren mentioned earlier, uh, our podcast, All of Life podcast, we've got an episode that's all goes deeper into just kind of how do we make sense of violence in the Old Testament, things of that nature. Um, And if you really want to take the deep dive, uh, sorry for the shameless plug, but my book, The Skeletons of God's Closet, the third section in there gets into like violence, holy war in the Old Testament, stuff like that. And so feel free to go check that out if you're wanting to dive deeper on this. <clears throat> Big picture today, though. Josh, are you just trying to soften what's happening here? No. Uh, this passage is bloody. It's warfare and not trying at all to get around that. What I am trying to do is put the splice of the film back into the biblical story as a whole, so that when people say to you, hey, the Bible is scary Mary, you can see that it's more nuanced than the caricatures, and there's more going on in the beauty of God's story. What's happening here is actually good and powerful. The the big picture here, God wants to remove the enemy from his kingdom, and we want that, right? Like you think of Ukraine and Russia today. Uh, The Russians have made themselves an enemy of the people of Ukraine. They have attacked and invaded. They have raped and pillaged. There has been a history of Russian aggression and oppression against Ukraine. And it's not just an event, but it's a pattern in their history. When President Zelensky, when he calls his people to fight the Russians, to kick them out of their homeland, to take them out, we get it. Like the people of Ukraine have lived in fear from Russian aggression. They have seen their daughters raped, their sons killed, and their land pillaged. They have to summon courage to defend their homeland. Victory here would be good news. If they removed all of the Russian military installations, they would say, hey, we can finally live in peace from aggression and oppression. The news of Russia's forces being destroyed and removed from their homeland would be good news. They wouldn't be like, dude, why would the president ever order that? They would be like, we can finally live in peace. Thank God, they would say, that the trauma and tragedy of this horrible history has come to an end. Similarly, the Amalekites getting knocked out here, it's good news. Israel would be rejoicing to hear this because they get the bigger story that it's wrapped up in. They have lived that bigger story. The Amalekites have made themselves an unrepentant enemy of God and his people, and now their day has come. And similarly for us, God's good kingdom is coming 
for his world. He will be victorious over all his enemies, over all those who remain unrepentantly opposed to his good kingdom and his good ways. I think the significance of this for us today is don't make yourself an enemy of God or your day of destruction will come. Don't make yourself an enemy of God or there's a day of destruction that's coming. Now, you might find yourself going, well, hey, I'm not an enemy of God, right? Like, I haven't invaded countries. I haven't killed the weak and vulnerable. I, man, I, I, I let God have his space and I have mine. But what we find in the bigger picture of the gospel is that if you have not submitted your life to God as king, then you are an enemy of his kingdom. Jesus says that you are either for me or against me. There's no neutral territory. There's no in-between. And in the bigger picture of the gospel, we have all made ourselves enemies of God's kingdom. We have all been like the Amalekites, vandalizing and, and causing havoc and, and, and all in the, in, in, towards God's shalom and his flourishing and his good purposes for the world. We are all those who find ourselves in need of amnesty, in need of grace, in need of forgiveness. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus gave his life for you. That Jesus said, the sentence of death that they were under, that you were under, I'm going to bear that myself so that you can go from being an enemy of God to his friend. That you can go from being in rebellion and opposition to becoming a citizen of his kingdom. To go in, Jesus is welcoming you in with open arms because he, God, the triune God has gone to the cross, has reconciled your sin, has paid the price that you could be reconciled with the triune God. And I would admonish you, I would encourage you today, don't put it off, right? You might be going, my, my life is going fine today. I'm, I'm okay. And, and maybe it is, right? But here's the thing. God is patient, but his patience will not last forever. We see that with the Malachites. He's been letting us go for generations, but now the day has come. I believe the, the, the language over here, it's pointing to going, God is patient with the sin and the injustice and, and the stuff that's wreaking havoc in his world. Because God is good, he is patient with our rebellion. But also because God is good, his patience will not last forever. And if you find yourself an enemy of his kingdom rather than one who has had your sin dealt with and come into the embrace of Christ and, and the arms of his kingdom then if you're not there, that's a road that leads to destruction. The road of seeking to live life on your own terms is a road that leads to destruction. So don't put it off. Turn to Jesus. Jesus. Let's keep going. Let's pick up in verse 8. So after Saul defeated the Amalekites, it says, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. Let's go down to verse 19. Samuel gets up and he goes to confront Saul and the heart of this confrontation, verse 19, he asks him, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I've brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Partial obedience is disobedience. We see here that partial obedience is disobedience. Uh, this is the fall of Saul, you might say. Like last week, we looked more at like the downward spiral of Saul and this 
trajectory he was on. And today, this is kind of like the crash and burn at the bottom. Saul only does a partial obedience here, and yet God considers it disobedience. Saul's like, hey, Samuel, I, I, I obeyed. I took out the Amalekite armies. I knocked them out of the land. And Samuel's like, no, you only partially obeyed. You pounced on the spoil, and you took the king for yourself. Now, Saul's act of disobedience here is that he spares King Agag and the animals. And we hear that today and think, oh, look at Saul. He's showing mercy. He's being nice. He's being kind, right? No, no, no. Why did God judge Saul for being kind and merciful here? And we're back kind of to scary Mary. But that's not what's happening here. Saul is not displaying mercy here, but greed. When we, once more, we put this spliced clip back into the biblical storyline as a whole, what we find is that Saul is displaying greed here, not mercy. Let me explain. You go back to Deuteronomy, and God commands Israel not to take plunder. You see, in the ancient world, greed was a major motivation for war. You conquer your neighbors, and you take their stuff. And you take their king captive like a trophy for your victory. God was saying, though, back for his people in Deuteronomy, he said, not so for my people. I don't want the surrounding nations, in essence, to be able to say, like, this was just for money. No, this is not about greed, but rather divine judgment. That's where this phrase, devoted to destruction, comes in. Like, we see that phrase here in this passage multiple times, devoted to destruction, and it comes from this Deuteronomy in this uh, earlier part of the biblical story. It's a specific Old Testament phrase that has to do with not taking for greed or for plunder, but rather devoting to God to protect the reputation and name of what what is happening here and why. When we take this spliced clip and we set it back into the biblical storyline, we see that Saul is not displaying mercy here, but greed. He's taking the king like a trophy for his victory. He's taking the animals as plunder to make himself richer. In verse 12, it says that he set up a monument to himself, to his own glory, rather than God. In verse 19, it says he pounced on the spoil, taking the best stuff for himself. And he's not only doing all this, Saul is doing all of this as king, as a leader held to a higher standard. And he's doing all this in disobedience against God. I love, like you and I, Like when Saul gets in front of it, he tries to justify himself. He makes some excuses. He tells Samuel, hey, well, the reason we took took the sacrifice to God, we did it for God. That's why I did it, right? And that's like saying, I cheated on my taxes, pastor, but it was so I could tithe to the church. (laughs) I robbed my neighbor, but it was so I could give it to charity. And God is not having it. God says, no, to obey is better than sacrifice. And he goes on and says, what you did actually was evil against me. God considers Saul's partial obedience to be disobedience. Because partial obedience is disobedience. Yeah, I remember when I first started following Jesus uh, back in the day, and I was like, God, you can have it all. Like, I'm, I'm following you. I'm all in, whatever. You, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll move overseas. I'll sell everything I have. And I started you know, going to church, and I was reading my Bible, and I was praying. I was practicing spiritual gifts. I was doing all things. I'm like, God, it's all yours. Then a few years in, God began to confront me on something. He was going, yeah, Josh, you're saying that, but there's still a part of your life, a part of your heart, a part of your story that you're still holding on to, that you're still clutching control of. For me, that had to do with girls and like romantic relationships and the way I approach and engage with those. And God began to convict me and reveal because of some of the way I've been going that I had even hurt the feelings of a couple of folks just from being reckless and stupid in the way that I went about those. And I began to kind of say as God confirmed me, but God, look, look, I'm going to church. Like I, I, I'm following you. I'm doing all this stuff. And God's going, yeah, but your partial obedience, Josh, is disobedience. Right? That area that you're holding on to is disobedience. And I wish I could say that was the last time that happened. (laughs) But I would suggest, man, it feels sometimes like the whole Christian life is God beginning to open up other corners of your life and begin to reveal areas of our partial obedience. I love the ancient mystic, Teresa of Avila. She talked about like the, the, like the house of the heart with all these different rooms or the castle, the interior castle of the heart. And Jesus, over time, he's continually going to different rooms. He's going, hey, we got to get the cobwebs out of here. We got to sweep the dust out of here. And that's what it's been like for me. As a matter of fact, even just preparing this passage, I realized that like 
man, this week, I realized man, about six weeks ago, my wife and I, I felt like God was saying, hey, I want you to give a certain amount of money to some specific folks, you know? And I was like, all right, God, it's all yours. This is your money anyways. Of course, I'll do it, I'll do it, all right? And then I got busy and kind of put it off and uh, I gotta figure out, you know, how to send it and whether to do that. I'll get to it. I'm just really busy right now. Right? And I came to realize, I was realizing, man, it's been like six weeks, almost two months. Really. I still haven't done it. And I was kind of using like, oh, I just, I'm busy to put it off. But I found God convicting me going, really? You know, and I opened it up in my heart and kind of going, oh no, I'm still kind of clutching control here. I actually, deeper down, I feel like money and security and those, I'm having a hard time letting go of some of those things. I found God once more going, hey, Josh, your partial obedience is disobedience. So if you see me at Chase Bank tomorrow afternoon making a wire transfer, you'll know what I'm up to, right? <laughs> right? But here's the thing for you and I. Like your partial obedience is disobedience. Your delayed obedience is disobedience. Your resentful obedience is disobedience. Your begrudging obedience is disobedience. And it is because you were made to live in trusting submission to God, going, God, I entrust myself to you. I trust your ways better than my ways. I trust you for my life better than trying to cling to and hold to it myself. And I wonder this morning, is there an area of your life that you're holding back from God today? Maybe where you're going, hey, God, you can have the 95%, but this 5% I'm gonna kind of hold back onto for myself. An area that you're having trouble trusting that Jesus is a good enough king to rule and reign over that specific area of your life. And Man, if you are, you and I, we can be so good at making excuses. And so don't be like Saul. Like, don't call Saul, right? And I try and get his excuses because he's got them all over this chapter. Saul, throughout this chapter, he's making excuses. And you and I, we can make the same excuses. We can be going like, God, but look at what I have done. So I was like, man, I, I went on the mission. I fulfilled these commands. And similarly, you and I, we can go on, but God, I've been going to church. I've been volunteering. I've been doing these different things. And God's like, yeah, but you're still being cynical and malicious online, right? And that partial obedience is disobedience. Like Saul, we can find ourselves going, but hey, but everyone else is doing it. Like the people over there, they took it for the spoils and the soldiers, they were doing it for the spoils. And some of you can, I, we can go and go, well, hey, my, my, my Christian friends, like they're also like, they're getting wasted, they're sleeping around, they're doing whatever. It's just, God, that was back then. The times have changed, things are different now. And, and God goes, no, your partial obedience is disobedience. We can find ourselves making other excuses, going, God, I just know better. I think my way is actually better. But Saul kind of goes, man, I, I recognize that like killing these animals and whatever, that's just going to be a waste. And so actually, I've got a better plan than yours, God. I'm going to do it this way. And used it as cover for his greed. And similarly, you and I, I think we can kind of go, yeah, God, I know you said generosity is the way to live. I know you said, but your vision for my, my finances, for my resources, for the way I live my life, that's, that's actually not the best way. And so, God, I want to clutch it in my own hands, and I want to do it my own way because, God, I, my way is actually wiser and better than yours. And God's going, you think you know better than me? The life that you were made for? Your partial obedience is disobedience. And then, oh, here's, here, here, here's my favorite excuse that we see here, right? My favorite excuse is, God, but I did it for you, right? Like, ultimately, yeah, I took all that stuff, but God, it was to make sacrifices for you. And I got to confess, sometimes, man, I wonder how much uh, Christian leaders, like, dude, we can fall prey to this one. I, see, I think of my friend, a friend of mine whose grandfather was kind of famous minister, grew up, and he, and, but she would say, man, Grandpa, you were so busy saving the world that you neglected your family. You know, And I wonder how many times, God, I was doing it for charity. I, I've heard of people who launched international charities and did amazing work out there, but then their family was ravaged and in rags. And I wonder how many things that at times we can justify because we're, quote, unquote, doing it for God. And yet Jesus says at the end, there are many who will say, God, didn't I do all, did I cast out demons and save all these people and whatever? Didn't I do all these amazing things in your name? And Jesus is like, away from me. I never knew you, right? Because your partial obedience is disobedience. 
I believe that God is calling us to something bigger. He's going, I want to establish you as a leader. Maybe not like a king like Saul over the whole country, but establish you before your friend group, before your family, before your workers, within your neighborhood going, if I'm going to entrust you, God is saying, with that kind of authority, with that kind of presence, with that kind of power in your area, then I need you to submit your life to mine as king. Because when you do, I can invest you that ability to image and to reflect me, my my goodness and all, but where this starts is like a full submission to Christ. Full submission going, Jesus, your ways are better than mine. I trust myself to you, Jesus, that we would entrust ourselves to Christ as king. All right, well, big picture. I wanna leave us with two takeaways this morning. What I would see is sort of two key takeaways from this passage. And the first one has to do with, uh, when we're reading the Bible, how to handle a tough passage. First takeaway, going, how do we handle a tough passage? Uh, I love, a beautiful thing about preaching through books of the Bible, like we, we tend to do here, is you can't avoid hard passages like these, ones that can maybe feel like landmines that you kind of want to go around. So, no, we got to grapple with this. we got to deal with this. And I think that's really helpful, because I've found over the years wrestling with not just kind of the fuzzy verses that we put on the mugs and the whatever things in your house, you know, like, but like, like wrestling with the fullness of God's story, it actually is sharpening and it helps you see God more clearly and more fully and understand him better. We believe in the authority of God's word here, that he has revealed himself to us and that the whole story points to Jesus. And so we wanna look for God and in the whole story. We want to understand him through the whole story. We want to submit ourselves to God and his authority through his word. But what do you do when you come across a challenging passage like this? Well, I'd encourage you not to ignore it, not to go around it, but to wrestle with it, to grapple with it. And here's a few tips that I think can be helpful as we do, as we become a people of the word, a people of God's word and spirit. First tip would be this. A, Like we place it in the whole story, right? Place the clip uh, in the context of the whole story. That uh, one of the challenges I think at times can can be we we, we read a verse out of context. And I love what a friend of mine, Dan Kimball, says in his book, How Not to Read the Bible, going, read it, but just don't read it this way, right? And one of these says, don't read a Bible verse, like on its own, out of context. Read it in the context of the passage. Read the passage in context of the book and the book in context of the story. It's one of the challenges, kind of like Scary Mary, is when passages get spliced out like clips and removed from the overarching story, and we can miss the bigger picture that they fit into. And so read the the tough passages in the context of the whole story. That's where the right context in which we begin to uh, understand it better. Tip B, second tip here, tip B, is take confidence in the character of God that the global and historic church under the authority of God's word in the scriptures historically has understood that God, the God revealed through this whole story is God of life, light, and love. That Jesus is the full, he's the revelation of God. You wanna know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. And so that doesn't mean that if we come to a tough passage, we can kind of discard it. No, but it means we can grapple with it going, okay, I may not understand fully what's happening here, but I know God that you are good. I know Jesus that you are my authority, and I can trust you even when I'm trying to grapple with how to reconcile that with this particular passage. Tip C, C I would say is, be okay with I don't know, right? Like sometimes you grapple with it and go, I don't know, but God, I'm still gonna trust you, right? And I've had some insights when it comes to scripture that have taken years. And I've actually come to love that about the Bible, that I think it was made for a lifetime of reflection and meditation and community that we would meditate on scripture, we reflect on it, we grapple with it, community, and there are times where I believe it's okay to come across and go, I'm not quite sure, God, what to do with that, but I'm okay with that. Like, Jesus, I know you. God, I know you, and I'm going to trust you with that. D, though, I'd say the, the final tip here would be, tip D, is um, that if you are really grappling with something, I believe you can bring that to the global and historic church. Like one of the things that's been so liberating for me over the years has just been to find, like, oh, I'm not the first person who asked that question, right? Like, how whatever, ridiculous to think like, oh, I I came up with that question, right? No, like there is a global historic, we as pastors are here with you to try and help grapple with them. We might not know the answer. We can can grapple with some of that together if you come across something. And I found such beauty reading a passage like this in the context of churches in Vietnam under persecution for me. 
like transform things. Oh man, they're under the boot, the power, and they're waiting for God to come and establish his kingdom and liberate them. And there's insights from Augustine and leaders in church history that, that are amazing. So big picture there is encouraging us to not avoid and go around, but to grapple with even the tough parts of God's story as we engage with the Bible seeking to be a people under the authority of his word. Second takeaway here is that this passage I believe it speaks to our future hope. This speaks to our future hope. We live in a world marked by oppression. I mentioned earlier the situations with Ukraine and the Nazis, and my mind goes to other places today too, like Joseph Kony in Uganda and South Sudan, whose violence has led to the abduction of over 66,000 children to become child soldiers and sex slaves, and displacing over 2 million people. Or I think of the Uyghurs in China and what many believe to be a new form of genocide, event of genocide happening today. We see this oppression around the world, and it's not just today, but historically, the blood that cries up from the ground of those who have been slaughtered and treated unjustly throughout the history of our world. And it's not just global and historic. There are people sitting right here in this room. There are some of you who have endured terrible and traumatic things from the hands of other people. And we can find ourselves asking, does God see? Does God care? Will God address it? And what I believe we find here is that yes, God is patient, but his patience will not last forever. Yes, God is patient. Because he, because he is patient, he is patient right now with the uh, situations like in Ukraine and the crazy things that's going on in the world and even the things that happen in our own lives. God is patient because he is good, desiring that people would come to repentance. But we also realize because God is good, his patience will not last forever. That there is a day is, that is coming when Christ will establish his kingdom securely for good and no longer will sin and death and evil be able to ra- wreak havoc and destruction that no longer will those who currently do be able to harm and threaten and destroy, that Jesus will uproot the enemy installations from his kingdom, so to speak, on earth, right? And that will be good news. We will rejoice that the victory of God has been accomplished on earth as in heaven, that Christ is Lord. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess and his kingdom be established, the security of his peace forever. And so <clears throat> this story has a happy ending, right? The story has a happy ending, not because Mary Poppins wins the day and flies back up into the clouds, right? But rather because Jesus has won the day and he is coming. He will descend back, bringing heaven to earth, establishing his kingdom forever. And we will live in the security of his peaceful kingdom. It's the invitation this morning is to Jesus, our better king. As we come to the table this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, this table is for you. We come to the bread and the wine, a sign of Christ's body given and his blood shed for us. That even now, Jesus, our exalted king, present with us through his spirit, he gives us of himself through his bread, his wine, through his body and his blood. And so as we come to communion this morning and we come in a posture of worship, we come to Jesus, a better king, who lived not a partial obedience, but a full obedience. Jesus, who did not make excuses, but rather who made atonement. We come to Jesus, who gave his life so that you and I, enemies of God, like the Amalekites, under a sentence of death, Jesus bore that sense in order that we could be reconciled to God, becoming friends of God and citizens of his kingdom. And so we come to this table this morning in hope that God will ultimately establish his kingdom and the security of his peace forever. Will you join me in prayer? Jesus, we come to you this morning, our better king. We thank you that you gave not a partial obedience, Christ, but a full obedience, Lord. You did not make excuses, but you made atonement, Lord. And God, I wanna pray right now, Lord, I wanna pray first, Lord, for any in this room who, God, 
are under the boot of the enemy right now, God, who are feeling the weight of being violated, of being mistreated, God. Maybe it's happening right now. Maybe it's wounds and scars from something in their past or maybe it's something they're undergoing in this season of life. And Jesus, I pray that you would minister by your spirit first, God. First of all, I just pray you would liberate them, God, that you would remove any shackles that are binding us as your people today. And second, God, where, where, where it's not, it's not gonna happen yet, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would bring the confidence of your hope that your kingdom is coming and that those enemies do not have the last word. Next, God, we also, God, I wanna pray, Lord, for any areas that we are living a partial obedience right now. God, we wanna live into a full obedience, Lord, reflecting you and entrusting ourselves to you. And so, God, I pray kinda of like you did for me this week. I just pray, Holy Spirit, if there are any God, that you would minister to us. I'm gonna create a space of silence here, and I just wanna ask, Holy Spirit, that you would minister to us as your people, that you would reveal any area of partial obedience, Lord, where you're calling them into full obedience. So I'm just gonna create space. I invite you to reflect before the Spirit of God any area of partial obedience where he's maybe calling you into a full obedience. Jesus, we want to give you a full obedience because you give your full obedience for us, because you are a good king that we can entrust ourselves to, because the whole story of Scripture points to you and speaks to your goodness. We want to know you more through your word, through your spirit, and give our lives fully to you. God, I thank you, Lord. We thank you this morning that we can have future hope in the midst of a world racked by oppression, injustice, greed, and other things, Lord, knowing that those things do not have the last word, Jesus, you do. Your kingdom does. So we entrust ourselves to you. We worship you this morning. We come to your feet to receive the bread and the wine, God, your body and your blood. Receive you giving yourself for us that we might live. Because we worship you, our better king. Amen.